a history of particles. And we are going to start first with a history of atomic elements because there are parallels to particles. And we're going to start first with BC times, uh, when there's only a handful of atomic elements that were known at the time. Copper, gold, and silver, of course, would be famous ones. And early philosophers attempted to explain you know, these as being made of something in common. Plato happened to call those roots. So he's on to something, although it wasn't quite correct. Now let's fast forward to the early 1800s when you know, many more elements were discovered. And then by then, uh, William Prout noticed that atomic weights of these elements were multiples of hydrogen. Right? And hydrogen, of course, being the smallest and, and the, the first atomic element in the periodic table. Now that discovery eventually led to this, right? Linearization of atomic elements by their atomic number. That'll be explained in a little bit, but you have the atomic number there on the bottom x-axis and you have the weight or mass uh, there on the y-axis, and it's a line. Now by the mid-1800s, more elements are discovered, and by then there's a sequence to this, and Dimitri Mendeleev put them into the first of the periodic table, and you see the current version uh, today, completely filled out. Now, Mendeley didn't know that, all these elements at the time, but now they could be predicted, the elements that had not been discovered yet. Now, early uh, 1900s, and Ernest Rutherford uh, finally discovered the proton, which was the, um, the key element, right? That atomic number in the sequence discovered earlier is based on the proton. Now this is the table completely filled out to present, uh, all the different elements, uh, but notice around middle of the 1900s, Maria Gilbert Meyer found stability in atoms at certain numbers, and these are called magic numbers of protons and neutrons. So you can see the numbers at the very bottom, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, etc. Magic numbers. So we'll summarize what the elements look like, and there's hydrogen, right? atomic number 1 or Z equals 1, and put that into the chart there and, and uh, map its mass or energy. Moving on to helium, right, you have z equals 2 and, and z equals 3, that's the number of protons. Now in blue it's also separated by neutrons, but what's important for this is the atomic number, which is the number of protons. So let's put them there at number 2 and number 3. And they're predictable because of this. Right, there's that line. And here's those magic numbers, stability at certain geometries, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50. Again, those are the magic numbers. Okay. Now let's compare this to subatomic particles. Now this is a really busy chart, so we're going to break this down. We're going to start first with the elements of the atom. There's going to be three sections here. Middle section is going to be, okay, what was discovered? Which particle? How were they discovered? Because this part is going to be really important. Um, how it was measured, how it was uh, discovered, and then why. And this is trying to answer the question, why is it doing something? And there are many different experiments, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, dual slit experiment, for example, photoelectric effect, and quantum physics evolved to help answer some of these questions of why. Now by 1932, which is when the neutron was discovered, um, quantum physics was pretty firmly established at that point. Now, let's move forward to cosmic rays. Right, it's beyond radioactivity, um, being able to discover more particles at first before particle accelerators. Uh, cosmic rays, think of it like a natural particle collider way up in the up upper atmosphere. Muon electron uh, was discovered, pion, lambda. So this is going to be the start of Masons and Baryons, which Looks like this. Now everything is kind of grouped together in families that you can see there. Neutrinos and electrons, quarks and mesons and baryons. Discovered from particle accelerators. And also what's important here is increasing in energy uh, over the years such that more particles can be discovered. Um, you see families of some of the particles here. The mesons and baryons are so many of them. haven't charted all of them, but I think you get the idea. But grouping these a little bit more, um, standalone particles, the lepton family that I mentioned, the neutrinos and the electrons, quark might be debatable. Uh, I'll cover that in a second. So it's, uh, the line is drawn halfway through between the, the quark, if it's a standalone particle or not. 
Um, but you notice one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, so the quark, the, the meson, baryon, tetraquark, and then uh, pentaquark. Now the Higgs and the tetraquark and the pentaquark have been discovered more recently in the last decade as particle accelerators have uh, much higher energies now. Okay. Now let's cover standalone particles first, and we're going to begin with a question. What if the neutrino was discovered before other particles? Would that have changed the current model of particles? All right, so to answer that question, let's kind of rearrange this. This is the same chart as before, but now let's rearrange things from time and assume the neutrino came first and then increasing in energy for the different particles that were discovered. The question is, would William Prout notice that particles are energies of uh, multiples of the smallest particle? Now, it's not exactly a fair question. Uh, you can't really add the masses of particles like you can for an atom. You know, so if combining two particles together, you don't add their masses. Uh, it probably looks something a little bit more like this. You take two the smallest particles together, um, so one plus one there is a particle count of two, but its energy is raised to the fifth power. So in this case to uh, 32. And you can see how the, uh, there's a huge discrepancy between the smallest particle and the largest one there is the Higgs. Um, you can see how that uh, discrepancy can now be um, simplified greatly by taking something to the fifth power. If you take 118 to the fifth power and it's a massive number, for example. So then the question is, could they be linearized? And the answer is yes. And it looks a little bit something like this. When you take it to the fifth power, and the math isn't going to be uh, reproduced here because everything has been documented, all the steps in a paper uh, there you see at the uh, bottom. Um, but it's also going to be that URL is also going to be placed in the description, so you can click on it easy, easily if you want to see more information. Okay, so it can be linearized. That's kind of cool. All right, but another question now. Would Maria Gopert Meyer once again find stability at magic numbers? And the answer to this question is also yes. We have to make an assumption that the neutrino is around 2.4-ish or so electron volts. And if it is, then yes. See the 8, 20, 28, and 50, those magic numbers? Those are the leptons, uh, relatively stable uh, neutrino and electron uh, family. The only number, uh, the only particle that electron that's missing from that sequence is actually the most stable of all, which is electron at the number 10. That's kind of cool. All right, another question. Would Mendeley be able to organize it into a sequence that predicted new particles? Um, this table here, it follows the exact same format as the periodic table of elements, but it's called the periodic table of particles. Um, it's the exact same data as the previous page, which was graphed, and this is just um, table format instead, organizing it. But the most important thing here is all the empty boxes. Um, so the, the higher numbers, um, which could likely be filled out as accelerators continue to pump more and more energy into proton collisions. And the lower end of the table uh, likely could be filled out with neutrino experiments finding more neutrinos. All right, so if the answer to those other three questions happen to be yes, let's just assume that the neutrino was discovered first and we notice this pattern with atomic elements. Well, then maybe just maybe, we might have a different model where standalone particles are formed from a number of neutrinos, just how like atomic elements are formed from a certain number of protons. But in this case, the mass is not added. Energy is taken to the fifth power when they merge. All right, those standalone particles, kind of cool, but let's try to explain composite particles. And we're going to start again with another question. All right, so what if the pentaquark was discovered before the proton. Would that have changed quantum theory? So again, we'll start with this chart, but let's assume that Ernest Rutherford uh, found it, the uh, proton to be a composite particle. He did not know that at the time. We know it to be true now. And let's assume the 2015 CERN discovery of the pentaquark was what he found way back in 1919. How would that change things? Now we're going to have to make one more assumption uh, here so that everything kind of fits together. So what if electrons are the stable 
particles that appear as quarks. All right? And again, saw this in standalone particles. You can't add the masses together. Right? This uh, energy increases at much higher power. So let's just assume now that that stable particle, the electron, is what makes up, uh, is what's seen as a quark. Okay, now with that. One more thing, let's rearrange this for the positron. That last uh, particle was actually a positron, the electron's uh, antimatter equivalent. So let's put that in the center, surrounded by a uh, four of those electrons, three-dimensional structure here, and ask the question, would Niels Bohr and early quantum theorists be able to explain the electron's orbital? Well, it gets a little bit easier, doesn't it? Um, it's a little bit different because now you not only have the attractive force that positron in the middle, but you also have a repulsive force because it's a composite particle. All right, in this case, uh, the dipole alignment actually happens to be what's seen in magnetism decreasing at the cube of distance. And so when you have an attractive force, Coulomb's force at the square of distance and one repelling at the cube of distance, you can use the sum of forces rule to draw an orbital at a certain distance. But if it's only a dipole alignment, then there's only certain uh, points where it um, has that sum of forces as zero. What you end up with is sort of the electron bouncing in and out at other times, creating that probability. Would that have answered their question early on? Maybe. And by the way, there's more details about other uh, elements. This shows just hydrogen. Uh, some of the elements, uh, helium and beyond, are discussed in the atomic orbitals paper URL at the bottom. All right, but another question. I fast forward to scientists that were working on decay. Would they understand the results of beta decay? All right, because there's a really confusing one, right? How does a proton become a neutron? At the same time, it ejects a positron and a neutrino. That's beta plus decay. Well, let's reverse that one and look at this again. All right, what if some random event, neutrinos that are bombarding Earth, happen to strike that positron with enough energy, eject it from the middle, and now you have a, a proton without the positron, so it's a neutral particle. It doesn't exist in the middle. You've ejected that positron and the neutrino. This is exactly what is seen in beta plus decay. And by the way, beta minus decay and electron capture are also two different processes, very similar that can be displayed uh, with the same method, and uh, more of that is documented again in that URL. And the last question we're going to ask here is, would early scientists on the, working on the standard model be better able to understand how composite particles were produced by particle accelerators? So here's a, a particle accelerator, two protons colliding. There's the quark that is uh, called like a, almost like a rubber band where it snaps back into place. It's hard to find a quark in isolation. So let's assume that there's the quark. Let's assume proton collisions can eject the positron and electron, which we see as a quark and antiquark. There's the mason. And what's remaining there? Three electrons, three quarks, there's baryon. Now, higher energies, more recent discoveries, it's the tetraquark. Two protons colliding, ejecting uh, those center objects. And then lastly, the pentaquark, which could be the true structure of the proton, quickly finding those four quarks and one antiquark. Now I realize it's very hard to unwind theories once they are established, but I pose this question, right? Imagine, imagine if early scientists had the information that we have today. Imagine that they knew about the pentaquark, that the early quantum theorists knew about the neutrino, right? It was discovered later. My question is, would we still have the theories that we use today?